today we start our sermon series for September, Man Up. You ladies look really excited. <laughs> now, I, I, I want you to know right off the bat that this sermon series is not a series exclusive for men. No, it's for everyone. In this series, Man Up, we're actually going to be looking at the story of Joseph from the Old Testament. And Joseph is such an example of, of, of one who manned up in an incredible way. And ladies, I guarantee you, uh, if your man acted a lot like Joseph, you'd be tickled to death. And we're going we're gonna to do this series... <laughs> J.D., I love you. You're a brave, brave man. So we're going to do this series, Man Up. Now, uh, you know, what does man up signify? You know, when, you know when, when I am told to man up or tell someone to man up, it's really an encouragement that you're going to have to rise above it, right? It's an encouragement that you're going to have, have to overcome that obstacle, it's kind of like an encouragement that you're going to have to stop complaining about it and do what is right, regardless, right? And so from time to time, the, the truth is all of us need to man up, if that's what it means. Uh, a couple weeks ago, my daughter TJ called me from Nashville. She's, you know, kind of complaining about this and this, and this isn't going right, and this and And I finally had to end the conversation with TJ. With things like that, you're just going to have to man up. She knew exactly what I was saying. Right? And uh, so we're going to do this series, Man Up. Now, I thought about calling it Suck It Up Buttercup. <laughs> but I didn't like that T-shirt. And so I thought, you know what? We're going to do Man Up uh, instead of Suck It Up Buttercup. But, you know, that's kind of really what I mean. So I'm just thinking, you know, I'm just hoping these kind of get in the right hands this morning. Uh, oh, nice catch. Man Up. And, uh, you know, just, you never know, you know, just uh, unbelievable. There we go. All right, Dawn is reaching for the man-up shirt. That's beautiful. Man up. Uh, I, I love what we're going to do in this series, um, man up. Uh, Joseph, uh, it's a story of Joseph. It comes from the book of Genesis. Now, I want to give you a, a personal challenge uh, right off the bat. Uh, the story of Joseph happens from Genesis 37 to through Genesis 50. It concludes Genesis, okay? And I would love for you, this month, if you would, in your personal Devo time, I would love to challenge you to read and reflect and, and respond on your own to the story of Joseph. It's an incredible story. It's an incredible story. You know, Genesis, first book of the Bible, it, the word Genesis means beginnings. It's the beginnings of human history. And when you break apart Genesis, you can kind of outline the whole book this way. The first 11 chapters of Genesis focus on four main events, and the last half of Genesis, 12 through 50, focus on four men. Four main events and then four men. Genesis 1 through 11 deal with the creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. Just focuses on those four main events. Then after that, it focuses on four men. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. What's interesting is Abraham and Joseph have the same amount of chapters dedicated to telling their story, but when you compare it, Joseph has more real estate in the Bible. The spotlight's on Joseph. And so it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And we're going to focus on Joseph. I have to tell you, Joseph is one of my favorite men in the Bible. He's the man. Uh, I have a little bromance with Joseph, if you know what I'm talking about. I love Joseph. Now, Jacob, his daddy, not so much. In fact, Jacob is my least favorite Bible character. I just don't like him. And I think uh, you'll see why. I want to I read Genesis uh, chapter 37. Let's start with uh, verse 1. And so the challenge, would, you, maybe you'll focus on, on these uh, this month. 
Look at this text, Genesis chapter 1. Or Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. Jacob lived in a land where his father had stayed, the land, land of Canaan. Now, nothing bad there, you know. I want to start telling the story. This is the account of Jacob's family. You know, yeah. Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17. Now, keep in mind, he's 17. Was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Billah, and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. That ain't good. <laughs> and he brought their father a bad report about them. That ain't good either. Now Israel, another name for Jacob, all right? Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. That ain't good. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. <laughs> That's not good. Joseph had a dream. Oh, boy. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. That ain't good. He said to them, listen to this dream that I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field and suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. That ain't good. Do you remember when you were 17? I mean, was your brain functioning properly at 17? I don't think so. Verse 8, his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and because of what he said. Then he had another dream. Joseph. And he told it to his brothers. Oh, that ain't good. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And he told his father, as well as his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept this matter in mind. And, and if you read the rest of the story, the story goes on that his brothers hated him so bad they conspired to kill him. And they were going to kill him. But at the last moment, one of them got the bright idea, hey, let, let's not kill him. Uh, you know, his blood would be on our hands. I know what. We can make a little money here. Let's sell him into slavery. And they sold him into Im some Ishmaelites that were headed down to Egypt. Then the brothers took his ornate robe and ripped it to pieces and dipped it in goat's blood and took it back to, to Jacob, Joseph's dad, and said, is this your son's robe? And he concluded, it is. A ferocious animal must have ripped him to shreds and he went into grief and mourning and refused to be comforted. This is a messed up, family i'm serious this family is a mess uh, this family is as dysfunctional as it gets it really is their family counselor now i doubt if she would have said it like this but i know she was thinking it even from their first session you are so messed up right kathy you are so messed up. And uh, I mean, th th it's as dysfunctional as it gets. Such a mess. And when you look at their family, and you look at the events of their family, there was all kinds of dysfunction. There was blatant sin. There was sexual immorality. There was hatred and jealousy. There's murder involved. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of just... I mean, this is as dysfunctional as it gets. Sibling rivalry is at the height. I mean, it's worse than Raymond and Robert. 
Romano, you know, and everybody loves Raymond. It is bad. I mean, it's as dysfunctional it, as it gets. And uh, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the, um, the, the story of the census taker and the situation he ran into. Uh, the census taker, uh, he was in West Virginia, and he steps up on this dilapidated porch on this dilapidated sh shack, and he's like knocking on the door, and a 13-year-old girl comes to the door. And, and so the uh, census taker says, hey, is, is your daddy home? Oh, no. Uh, he's been in jail for three years. Okay. Uh, is your mama home? Nope. She ran off with moonshiners. Well, do you have a brother or sister? And, and she said, well, yeah, I have one brother and one sister. Well, is your, is your sister home? No. She, uh, uh, she joined the circus. What about your brother? Is your brother home? No, he's at Harvard. Harvard? Your brother's at Harvard. What's he studying at Harvard? Oh, nothing. He ain't studying anything at Harvard. They're studying him. <laughs> now, I am so thankful you're here today because in light of Joseph's family and in light of this West Virginian family, your family looks pretty good about right now, doesn't it? Whew. I'm telling you what, this... Uh, Joseph's family, uh, uh, so bad, so dysfunctional. And I, I blame Jacob. I do. Jacob as a husband was just, uh, it's bad. Uh, he had four wives. J J Joseph was 17. Now think about it. Joseph was 17 and he, was, he had three stepmoms. And ten stepbrothers. That ain't good. And Jacob had four wives. Four unhappy women. That ain't good. Two of them were sisters. <laughs> that really ain't good. And you've heard the saying, when mama's not happy, ain't nobody happy. What about when there's four mamas not happy? This is crazy. I mean, this is Jerry Springer material. And uh, a Jacob, man, he's just, you just read his story. Just look at his, he's so messed up. He embraced his culture and he embraced, poly, you know, being a polygamist. And uh, he has four women. And then when you look at him as a dad, he's way too passive. Way too passive. He never is correcting his sons. Major things happen. He never does anything about it. He's so focused on himself. He's so selfish. He only does what he wants to do. And he never does what other people need. Too passive. And here's the worst part about dysfunction. Dysfunction often breeds greater dysfunction. And when you look at the lives of Joseph's brothers especially, whoa. They were worse than Jacob. Hmm. Yesterday at the huddle, uh, we, had a, we had a great time at the huddle. We had a great crowd, a bunch of guys, and uh, uh, we're doing man up at the huddle as well and studying the life of Joseph because there's just too much to do in one month's a, you know, sermon. sermon. So uh, I did an experiment with the guys yesterday, and I said, hey, guys, now just, you know, for conversation I suppose and assume that there can be a perfect family I want you to fill in a couple of sentences finish some sentences a perfect family will always we've got some great answers a perfect family will always love one another honor one another respect one another pray for one another um, you know have each other's back a perfect family will always you know honor a perfect family will communicate to one another. A perfect family will always be honest with one I mean, it was just great answers. Great answers across the board. It was, it was fun. And I said, well, let me flip it a little bit. And from the negative point of view, a perfect family will never... A perfect family will never do something to harm each other. A perfect family will never abuse or take advantage of another. A perfect family will never lie to an to each other. A perfect family will never deceive one another. A perfect family will, will never abandon. 
you know, and just the answer is, we know, don't we? I wish Jacob would have reviewed the list. But he didn't. And he just kept passing on dysfunction. Their family was such a mess. Such a mess. And so you might be asking, okay, so why are we taking so much time to look at their mess? Well, I want you to know that um, there's a message in the mess. There's a message in the mess. I love Romans 15.4, don't you? Look at this. Romans 15.4 It simply says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. Everything written in the Old Testament was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. I want you to know that the word of God is for our present instruction and our future hope. The word of God is always for our present instruction and our future hope. There is a message in this mess. And I want you to know God wants us to know the story of Joseph. He wants us to know the story of Joseph. And the story of Joseph is basically, he teaches us how to man up. He teaches us how to man up. Joseph comes from a family that was as dysfunctional as it gets. I can't even imagine a worse scenario. As dysfunctional as it gets. But Joseph, he, he, though he starts out of dysfunction, Joseph doesn't stay there. I love that about Joseph. He doesn't stay there. He rises above it. I mean, it got bad. But he rises above it and he shows us how to man up. I love the story of Joseph. And here's what you're going to learn as we go through. And as you read Genesis 37 through 50, you're going to learn Joseph. He didn't play the role of victim. Now, he was a victim of dysfunction, but he never played the role. In fact, you will never, ever find Joseph complaining, not once. Some pretty bad things, some pretty unfair things happened to Joseph. You will never find him complaining. Now, I have to be honest with you, I have a feeling I would be tempted to complain a little bit. I have a feeling if I was sold into slavery and I was taken to uh, Egypt, I would go around saying something like this, no, speak Egyptian, no, speak Egyptian. No comprendo españoles. I, I don't know. I, mean, you, uh, I, 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 think, I think coming out of my mouth might sound something like, this ain't fair. I'm not a slave. I don't deserve this. This sucks. And I don't ever use that word. But I think I'd be tempted to complain. Might even be a, God, why me? Arthur Ashe, remember him, famous tennis player? Uh, Arthur Ashe contracted AIDS via a blood transfusion. And one day a reporter was just interviewing him and talking to him and and said, you know, um, aren't you angry at God? Aren't you mad at God and and don't you angrily at God? Just, why me, God? Why me? His response was so interesting. It just, it just, it keeps making me think. He responded, when I stood up holding the championship trophy at Wimbledon, I never asked, God, why me? But I should have. You're never going to find Joseph complaining. And you know what? You're never going to see Joseph using the circumstances of his life as an excuse. 
Too often we use the circumstances of things that have happened to us as an excuse for our own indulgence and our own sin and our own laziness. Not going to find that in Joseph. He mans up. And he rises above it. And you never find him complaining. There's a message in this mess. Joseph overcomes dysfunction. He overcomes, uh, you know, such a dysfunctional family. He breaks the chains. He doesn't carry it into his own life. He doesn't carry it into his own family. He breaks it. How did he do it? Here's how he did it. Joseph believed and knew there was a sovereign God in charge of everything. Joseph knew that everything in life, everything in life, either was initiated by our sovereign God or given permission by our sovereign God. And Joseph was convicted of that and held on to that conviction even when things didn't make sense. And here's the good news for us today. We have a Messiah. All of us have a Messiah. Regardless how bad things seem right now, I want you to know we have a Messiah. And don't you love Romans 8, 28? Joseph lived out the principle believing and trusting the principle of Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. He believed. He knew there was a sovereign God in charge of everything and always present and tirelessly working on behalf of the good of those who would just trust him. And he held on to that conviction regardless what happened. And the Lord blessed him. And the Lord blessed him. John Maxwell said, life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you respond to it. Here's what I want you to know. I want you to hear loud and clear. Your family may be dysfunctional. You may be in the thick of it right now. You don't have to stay there. Because we have a Messiah. We have a God who loves saving us from our mess. I think that's why they call him a Messiah. And our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is ever-present. And he's always at work. And he's working all things for the good of those of us who would just trust him and love him and hold on to that, that faith. So regardless how bad things seem right now, can I remind you today, we have a Messiah. And here's what's really cool. Your family's dysfunction that was kind of passed on to you does not eliminate you from being a person of significance in the story of God. <laughs> in fact, it might better qualify you. Because God loves taking messes and being the Messiah. It doesn't eliminate you for being a, such a significant part in the story of God. You don't have to stay there. You can man up. You can rise above it. And you can do the right thing. And God's going to work for your good every time. And can I remind you one more thing? This is God's story. Genesis chapter 37 through 50 is not Joseph's story. Um, the hero in Genesis 37 through Genesis 50 is not Joseph. It's God. It's God working through the life of Joseph. And I, I just want you to know, it's not about us. And it is never, not even for a minute, our story. 
Too often, you know what you and I do? Too often, we try to figure out how to fit a big God into our little story. Life is all about how little old us fits into his awesome story. It's God's story. And I want you to know today, you are part of God's story. And that may require some of us to man up. 